All right, so chapter 25 is the history of life on Earth. Past organisms were a lot different than the ones that are living now. Again, this chapter is going to focus on macroevolution. The fossil record is able to show us these macroevolutionary changes over large periods of time, such as when terrestrial vertebrates first appeared, um, how mass extinctions have impacted um, living organisms, and how flight began in birds. Um, Earth's early conditions made life possible. There were chemical and physical processes um, that were taking place that have, are thought to have produced very simple cells um, through several stages. First was by producing um, small organic molecules abiotically. Um, joining these molecules together um, is step two into macromolecules. Um, packaging these molecules into what we know as protocells was step three. And then finally in step four, um, the origin of molecules that were able to replicate themselves. So wait, dating back, um, organic compound synthesis on early Earth, just to give us kind of some context, 4.6 billion years ago, Earth and the solar system was formed between 3.9 and 4.2 billion years ago. Um, the Earth was bombarded by rocks and ice um, that likely um, vaporized water and prevented seas from forming beforehand. Um, Earth's early atmosphere um, most likely contained water vapor and some other chemicals that were released from volcanic eruptions, such as gases like nitrogen, nitrogen oxides, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and hydrogen sulfide. In the 1920s, Offerin and Haldane hypothesized that this atmosphere was an early reducing, or sorry, this early atmosphere was a reducing environment. And in 1953, Miller and Urey, you may remember us talking about them earlier, conducted lab experiments showing how organic molecules could be synthesized abiotically in such an atmosphere. Um, it's not definitive at this time as to whether um, they formed in the atmosphere or not. It's also been hypothesized that these compounds might have been synthesized near volcanoes or deep sea vents. Um, but Miller-Urey type experiments um, have been demonstrated that organic molecules can form in different types of atmospheres. Um, it's also thought, um, sorry, it's also been shown that amino acids are present in meteorites. So how do we produce macromolecules abiotically? Um, RNA monomers um, produce, um, are produced spontaneously from simple molecules. Um, organic molecules have the ability to polymerize. Remember, that's one of the things that has to take place with your macromolecules if they are concentrated on hot sand, clay, or rock. Protocells, we talked about those as well, um, replication and metabolism are integral part properties of life. Um, they appear to have occurred together. Um, they're thought to have been fluid-filled vesicles that have a membrane-like structure. Water, lipids, and organic molecules are able to spontaneously form vesicles, sorry, in water, lipids and organic molecules can form vesicles spontaneously with that lipid bilayer. Um, the presence of clay can increase the rate of vesicles forming. Um, and vesicles are able to exhibit just simple reproduction, metabolism, and maintain um, an internal chemical environment. So the first genetic material is most likely thought to be RNA as opposed to DNA. Um, RNA molecules such as ribozymes um, are known to catalyze lots of different reactions. Um, they can produce, um, ribozymes can produce complementary copies of RNA. Um, natural selection um, has led to the production of self-replicating RNA molecules. Um, these RNA molecules um, that were more stable or were capable of replicating more quickly um, would have left the most descendant RNA molecules on our planet. And this early genetic material may have formed what we call an RNA world. Um, vesicles with RNA um, that were able to reproduce um, would have been classified as protocells. Um, RNA then could have provided the template for DNA 
um, which is um, obviously a more stable um, form of genetic material. So the fossil record documents how life has changed on Earth over time. Um, sedimentary rocks um, get deposited into strata layers, and they are the primary source of fossils. We talked about those back at our beginning um, chapter study on evolution. Um, very few individuals have fossilized, and those that have fossilized, only um, even fewer have been identified. Um, it is biased, the fossil record is, in favor of species that existed for an extended period of time, were abundant, widespread, and had hard parts that were capable of being fossilized. Um, these discoveries, when we find the fossils, um, it's a matter of chance oftentimes. It could be due to prediction. Um, so paleontologists found Tiktaalik. Um, it's an early terrestrial vertebrate. Um, by focusing on sedimentary rock um, that would have been present at a specific time and in a given environment. And so here we can kind of see some of the fossils that have been identified and their relative age. How do we date these rocks and fossils? This is something that um, I know that you've covered previously. Um, we're just going to kind of review it in context. Um, the layers of strata can reveal the relative ages, but we can actually date the fossils absolutely using radiometric dating. Um, a parent isotope is going to decay to a daughter isotope at a constant rate. These rates have known half-lives, which is basically half the time it takes for the parent isotope to decay in amount um, from the initial amount to half of what it has, at, sorry, to go to 50% of the original amount. We can date fossils in using carbon um, up to 75,000 years old. And older fossils, um, there are some isotopes that can be used to date rock layers both above and below the fossil. So there you can see your half-life graph. Again, every half-life you have reduced the amount of the original isotope by one half. So some key events in life's history include um, the formation of single-celled and multi-celled organisms, as well as colonization of land. Um, geologic record is divided into three eons, the Archaeon, the Proterozoic, and the Phanerozoic eons. Um, Phanerozoic um, is focused on multicellular eukaryotic life, and within that eon, um, we have three eras, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. Um, there are some key boundaries between geological divisions that correspond to extinction events that have been described using the fossil record. So there you can kind of see your eras, um, some events that have taken place over those times and the periods and the epoch, epochs, sorry. And then we get into the Paleozoic, um, and we just are keep going back further and further until Earth was um, first um, identified. So if we look at this in a clock format, you've got the origin of the solar system on Earth, um, but just before two o'clock, and then you've got your prokaryotes showing up around three o'clock, atmospheric oxygen showing up between um, five and six o'clock. Um, we start to see those single-celled eukaryotes around seven, the multicellular eukaryotes are showing up are between um, around 8.30 or so. And again, I'm going off of a clock clock. Um, and then we start to see um, the colonization of land and we get into the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic eras. Animals are thought to have first shown up around 10.30 or so. And again, these are all based on billions of years ago. So the first single-celled organisms um, are thought to have been um, our stromatolites. Those are the oldest known fossils. Um, these rocks are formed by accumulating sedimentary layers on bacterial mats. Um, they date back about 3.5 billion years ago. Um, prokaryotes were pretty much the only inhabitant of the Earth um, from 3.5 to 2.1 billion years ago. Oxygen, um, photosynthesis and the oxygen revolution 
oxygen is pretty much formed from biological species, biological organisms. It's produced by photosynthesis um, and it reacts with dissolved iron and precipitates out to form um, these iron oxide formations. Um, about 2.7 billion years ago, oxygen began accumulating in the atmosphere and we started seeing more um, iron rich terrestrial rocks rust. Um, and when oxygen um, first started to accumulate um, between 2.7 and 2.3 billion years ago, several prokaryotic groups um, became extinct. Um, the ones that were able to survive and adapt um, used cellular respiration to harvest energy. Um, it's thought perhaps that this rise in oxygen was initially caused by ancient cyanobacteria and that later increases in oxygen might have been caused um, through the evolution of eukaryotic cells that contain chloroplasts. So eukaryotes, the oldest fossils for eukaryotic cells date back about 2.1 billion years ago. Um, again, your eukaryotic cells have your nuclear envelope, envelope your mitochondria, your endoplasmic reticulum, your cytoskeleton. And we talked about the endosymbiont theory back when we talked about photosynthesis and respiration um, with cell structure. We talked about chloroplasts and mitochondria. Um, that this theory proposes that mitochondria and plastids, such as chloroplast, um, were um, initially small prokaryotes that were coexisting within larger host cells, because that's what an endosymbiont is, a cell that lives within a host cell. Uh, the prokaryotic ancestors of the mitochondria and the plastids um, most likely gained entry to these host cells um, because they were undigested prey or they were in internal parasites joy um, as they became more interdependent um, the hosts and the endosymbionts would have um, become one organism and serial endosymbiosis um, is thought that um, my mitochondria evolved before plastids um, as a result of multiple endosymbiotic events. So there we have our plasma membrane, our ancestral prokaryote, um, and we have the DNA in there. Um, we start to see the ER form, and that's going to lead us to our aerobic heterotrophic prokaryote, which will then um, join with an ancestral heterotrophic eukaryote, and we will get um, our eukaryotic cells. And then we have the ones that also take in a photosynthetic prokaryote, and they can take in one of those plastids and form an ancestral photosynthetic prokaryote. So evidence of endosymbiosis um, that supports this idea with both mitochondria and plastids. Um, their inner membranes are similar to that of a plasma membrane in a prokaryote. Um, they divide similarly in those organelles um, as well as some of the prokaryotes. They're able to transcribe and translate their own DNA because they do have their own source of genetic material. And their ribosomes are more similar to prokaryotic ones as opposed to eukaryotic. Multicellular organisms, where did these come from? Um, evolution of eukaryotic cells allowed for a greater range of unicellular forms. Um, and then an additional wave of diversification occurred when the multicellular cells were able to evolve and give rise to different living forms, such as algae, plants, fungi, and animals. Um, when you compare DNA sequences, the common ancestor of multicellular eukaryotes dates back about 1.5 billion years ago, and the oldest known fossils of these eukaryotes are small algae, and they lived about 1.2 billion years ago. Um, a hypothesis known as snowball earth suggests that there were some periods of extreme glaciation um, that basically confined life to either um, areas around the equator or deep sea vents between 750 and 580 million years ago, the Ediacaran biota, or biota, was an assemblage of both larger and more diverse soft body organisms. Um, so they lived between 535 and 575 million years ago. So when we start to see an abundance of fossils, 
Um, these have to do, tend to appear with these extinction events. The Cambrian explosion refers to the sudden appearance of fossils that resembled modern animals um, between 525 and 535 million years ago. Um, we do see some phyla that occurred appeared earlier, such as sponges, nadarians, and mollusk. Um, this was the first evidence of predator and prey interactions. So there you can kind of see some of the ones that were seen. And then we start to get into land colonization. Um, fungi, plants, and animals first started to colonize land about 500 million years ago. Um, plants use vascular tissue to transport their materials um, within the plant, and these showed up about 420 million years ago. Both fungi and plants, um, and we'll get into this more with ecology, um, have formed mutually beneficial associations. It's thought they probably colonized land together. Mammals are part of the group of animals we know as tetrapods. Both arthropods and tetrapods are the most widespread and diverse land animals. Um, and it's thought that tetrapods evolved from lobe finned fishes about 365 million years ago. And that the evolution of specific mammalian features um, can be traced through to trace through gradual changes over periods of time. So the rise and fall of groups is going to have an um, seen through speciation differences as well as extinction rates. Plate tectonics, um, the land masses of Earth at three different points in time formed what we know as a supercontinent. Um, 1.1 billion, 600 million, and 250 million years ago. And the idea behind plate tectonics is that the Earth's crust is basically plates that are floating on top of the Earth's mantle. Um, these plates move slowly as a part of continental drift. Um, both oceanic, oceanic and continental plates can collide. They can separate or they can slide past one another. When they interact with one another, they cause mountains and islands to form as well as earthquake, earthquakes to erupt. So there's your crust floating on top of the mantle and then your inner and outer core. And there are the plates um, making up our planet. Um, some issues with continental drift. Um, the supercontinent Pangaea that formed about 250 million years ago led to a deepening of the ocean basins, a reduction in shallow water habitats, and a colder and drier inland climate. Um, how that can impact on living organisms, the climate can change depending on the continent, whether you are in the northern area or the southern area. Um, when we have land masses separate, we can have allopatric speciation. And fossils and living groups, their distribution is going to be representative of how these continents have moved. So there's some similarity in fossils, both in South America and Africa, and that kind of supports this idea that the continents were previously attached to one another. So there you can kind of see the continents um, over time, how they have separated. Um, mass extinctions. Um, most species that have lived previously are now extinct. Um, extinction can be caused as a result of changes in that species environment. Um, when we have dramatic increases in extinction rates, we call these events mass extinctions. Um, typically, these are due to global environmental changes that are pretty disruptive. Um, there have been five of these so far, and as a result, 50% um, of the species that have existed on Earth are no longer present. So there you can kind of see the peaks. Permian extinction is the boundary between your Paleozoic and your Mesozoic eras, 255, 251 million years ago. Uh, it occurred in less than 5 million years and led to the extinction of over 95% of marine animal species. Um, some factors that might have contributed, intense volcan volcanoes um, now in what we know as Siberia, Global warning due to the increase in carbon dioxide emissions from those volcanoes erupting, um, a temperature gradient being reduced from the equator to the poles, and oceanic, oceanic anoxia, um, so the reduction of oxygen from the reduced mixing of the ocean waters. 
Cretaceous mass extinction was 65.5 million years ago, and it separated Mesozoic from Cenozoic. Um, several of the organisms that went extinct include uh, marine species, about half of all marine species that existed at the time, and many terrestrial plants and animals, and this would be when the dinosaurs uh, went extinct. Iridium is present in sedimentary rocks, so that kind of suggests that there was some sort of meteorite impact around this time period, and that dust clouds caused by the impact would have blocked sunlight and had a significant impact on global climate. And I'm not about to try to say the name of that crater, um, but this crater off of the Mexico coast is um, evidence of a meteorite and um, based on its presence and data collected from that location, it appears to date to that time. So we're not focusing on all the extinctions, those are just a couple. Um, is there a sixth mass extinction underway? Um, the current rate of extinction that we are having um, present on Earth is about 100 to 1,000 times the typical background rate. Um, we typically see these extinction rates increase when global temperatures increase, and it is thought that there will most likely be a sixth one caused um, as a result of human impact um, unless there's some significant action taken to reduce our impact our, um, globally speaking. So there you can kind of see where the mass extinctions occurred and where they had impacts in terms of temperature and then the relative extinction of the marine animals is what we're focusing on in this graph. So some consequences, consequences as a result of mass extinctions. These can alter your ecological communities as well as the niches available to these organisms. It can take anywhere from five to 100 million years for the diversity um, that's present um, to recover from one of these extinction events. Um, the percentage of marine organisms um, that were predators increased both after the Permian and the Cretaceous mass extinction. And these extinction events can lead the way for adaptive radiation. So there you see the peaks with the predators. So what is adaptive radiation? Adaptive radiation is the evolution of diversely adapted species from a common ancestor. Um, we see these, um, again, as a result of mass extinction, um, when new characteristics evolve or when new regions are colonized. So worldwide speaking, mammals underwent an adaptive radiation after dinosaurs um, went extinct um, because the dinosaurs um, disappeared, a pretty significant predator. It allowed for the expansion of mammals, both in diversity as well as size. Um, some other notable radiations include photosynthetic prokaryotes, um, predators during the Cambrian period, um, land plants, insects, and tetrapods. So there you can see there's the common ancestral mammal and then three very distinct groups of organisms, of animals um, made of various species. Um, we can also have regional adaptive radiations. Um, these are when organisms are able to colonize new environments and they have little competition. Um, the Hawaiian Islands are one great example of adaptive radiation. So here you can see on these islands all the different species that have been able to adapt to this environment. We can also have um, changes happen on a genetic level. Um, there can be some pretty significant changes in body form as a result in changes in sequence as well as regulation of your developmental genes. Um, so we talked about some external factors that can influence um, the formation of new species or having these um, evolutionary events occur. We can also see this on a genetic perspective. Um, when we have changes occur in these developmental genes, um, that can have a significant impact on the physical manifestation of that organism. So heterochrony is basically going to be an evolutionary change in either 
the timing or the rate of these developmental events, and that can have a pretty significant impact on the body shape. Um, the different shapes between human and chimpanzee skulls are due to just some small changes in growth rates. Um, it can also have an impact on reproductive development um, in regards to the development of organs that are not involved in reproduction. In pedomorphosis, um, reproductive development accelerates um, compared to somatic development. So you can have a species that is capable of reproducing sexually, um, but still have some juvenile body features um, that were present in an ancestral species. So there you can see the difference in the skulls. We can also have some pretty significant um, evolutionary change um, as a result of where um, body parts are placed and their organization, at least the genes that control those two aspects. Homeotic genes are um, going to be able to determine where wings and legs will develop on a bird or where how a flower is organized. Um, Hawks genes are specifically a class of these homeotic genes that provides some positional information as during development. And if so, if they get expressed in the wrong location, you can have the wrong body parts attached to, or you can have body parts attached to the wrong location. So here with crustaceans, you could have a swimming appendage produced instead of a feeding appendage. So need to make sure that those are being regulated properly. Um, that there was such diversity during the Cambrian explosion is definitely a, a pretty large question. Um, it's thought perhaps the developmental genes might have played a significant role, um, leading to new morphological forms um, that may have occurred as a result of gene duplication events that led to additional developmental genes being produced. It's thought, however, that with these morphological changes, they are probably not due as much to the sequence, but to the regulation of the genes. Um, so here you have um, a, a fish, three-spine stickleback. In lakes, it has fewer spines than, it ha than the marine relatives of this fish. The gene sequence is exactly the same, but the regulation of the gene differs. Um, evolution is not focused on a specific goal. Um, it is tinkering. Um, it is a process in which new forms array, arise through slight modifications in existing forms. Uh, most new biological structures had um, some sort of pre-existing structure that they evolved from. Eyes would be one example. Complex eyes have evolved from more simple photosensitive cells um, that were able um, to evolve multiple times. Exaptations are structures that evolved in one context but then got used for another function. Um, natural selection can't create structures, but it can lead to an improvement in structures um, in the context of how it is currently being used. So here you have your eye cells, um, and then over time, um, as these eyes, you've got your primitive eyes there. So the first one, you've got the patch of pigmented cells, then you've got the eye cup. Um, so you, uh, you've got them kind of set up in that circular environment. Then you hold the camera type eye with the pinhole. We have the primitive lens. That's the first time we start talking about the lens. And then we have the complex camera lens type eye. So trying to understand an evolutionary progression just from the fossil record is not always the best way to go about it. We need to look at things more broadly. Um, species selection model suggests that differential speciation success can have an influence on evolutionary trends but the trends themselves do not um, imply a direction for a specific phenotype. So here you can kind of see um, in, um, data about the horses, various horses undergoing evolution. And here we just kind of have a summary of when everything took place.